Okay, now you can hear me. Yeah, we can, but you're not sharing the screen. Ah, no, you are. That's all good now. All good? Yeah, all good. Okay. Am I good to go? Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone, for hanging on to the end. Um, I want to give a summary of work we have been doing for the last approximately five years to pursue and understand um, electron pair density properties of um, cuprates and now other superconductors. So this, I'm, I'm gonna talk about six different projects, but don't worry, just about five minutes each. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But there's been a big international team of people working on these projects, and I show them all here. And during the talk, I'll tell you who did what, where, when, and at which time. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, visualizing the pair density in the cuprate superconductor of Visco, the condensed superconducting pair density. Then I'm going to talk about the vortex core structure in, or the vortex halo structure in the same compound. Then I'm going to talk about visualizing the energy gap structure in the same compound. Uh, then I'm going to talk about quasiparticles, visualizing the quasiparticles in real space. Quasiparticles apparently of the pair density wave state. Then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the pseudogap QPI, but Xu uh, Chu Wang, who was here, talked about this yesterday, I believe. Um, and then last but not least, I'll talk about broken rotational symmetry in the pair density wave in the cuprates. So this is a picture of the surface of BISCO. Each dot there is a bismuth atom. Underneath the bismuth atom is the apical oxygen atom. Underneath the apical oxygen atom is the copper atom. With some geometrical precision, something like 15 picometers, we know where every atom in the unit cell and in every unit cell of the field of view is geometrically. So to study the electronic structure, um, we stop the STM from scanning at each location and fix its relative distance from the surface and then vary the voltage between the sample and the tip and measure the current, take the derivative, the current the voltage for single electron tunneling, but not for pair tunneling, uh, the IDV is related to the density of electronic states. And then we map this function throughout the field of view to get the information we want. So for much of the last several decades, when you heard the STM talks about superconductors, you were seeing measurements of the Bogolubov quasiparticles, which appear after the superconducting order parameter, after the condensation has occurred, and the gap has opened in the spectrum of the density of states. But in the real superconducting material, there, you can think there are two fluids. There's one fluid, which is the BCS condensate. It's some, pair, it's some uh, product state of pair states, a many body wave function of electron pairs. And then coexisting, there's the single particle excitations, which are the bonded bonds. And in principle, you could see both of them. And in principle, you could see both of them simultaneously with the correct machine. And that's what we have been attempting to pursue. To see the, so to see the single electron tunneling, you just need to measure the differential conductance for a single electron tunneling from a normal metal tip, let's say a tungsten tip. If the density of states in the tip is flat, then the differential tunnel conductance tells you the density of states at the location of the experiment. No problem. But, and so that's what we use to image this branch, this branch, and this branch, but not the condensate. To image the condensate, you need to use pair tunneling. So for pair tunneling, you would have a superconducting tip and a superconducting sample. They each have a superconducting order parameter. You can take a toy model. I mean, you can solve this in a complex Hamiltonian, but you can take a toy model of Cooper pair condensate decaying into vacuum. This is vacuum. And you know, amplitude on the other side, vice versa, solve that equation. 
It contains geometrical factors having to do with the decay length into vacuum, which has to do with the work function of the material. And um, also, you know, the effective mass of the carriers um, and the product of the two um, amplitudes of the wave functions on each side. So you can, you know, integrate over distance, over volume, and turn this into a simple equation, the Amagarka-Baratov equation. The critical Josephson current, the dissipationless current of pairs through the junction, times the junction resistance, which is defined by the differential conductance at high voltage, far away from the gap energy, is proportional to the product of the two order parameters. And we're going to take those two order parameters to be proportional to the square root of the density of condensed pairs, which they would be in a BCS superconductor. And finally, we're going to take the density of condensed pairs in the tip to be a constant and ignore that. So under those circumstances, if I square the Josephson critical current, square the junction resistance, then I have a number which is proportional to the um, density of condensed pairs in the sample at this location. At least that's the working hypothesis. Now, people have wanted to do this for many years, for many decades, but you can't really do it. Um, not yet, anyway. And the reason is that, um, you know, if you take an energy gap here um, for the tip and the sample, let's say a typical energy gap near one millivolt, and you take a junction resistance, a typical junction resistance for an STM is about a giga ohm. So then under those circumstances, uh, the Josephson critical current uh, will be picoamps and the Josephson energy will be nanovolts, which is equivalent to tens of microelectron volts. So to stabilize the phase difference across a single atom junction, either the junction has to have a resistance of a few kilo ohms. You can do that in a device, but it's hard to do it in a microscope. Or you have to operate it at micro Kelvin temperatures. We can't do this. Yes. So one, can you calculate this G? Yeah. Uh, would you have the orbital functions, orbital symmetries on both sides? As yeah, on this assumption here, both sides have the same, same symmetry. Yes. Yeah. And I'll show you that for the cuprates, we have to satisfy that condition in a tricky way. So what we can do is measure the pair current in the phase diffusive limit. So if you have a circuit like this, capacitance, critical Josephson, and critical current and shunt resistance and a bias source in the outside, you know, current supply, then you can write down the, um, the classical um, equation of motion for the phase difference across this junction. It looks like this. And um, now if the capacitance is small, suppose you can drop this term and if KT is much bigger than the Josephson energy, then the phase is fluctuating wildly across the junction. So in terms of the um, energy, the Josephson energy is a function of the phase difference. Instead of being at a fixed phase difference, the phase is making all these transitions between different locations on the potential. Okay, you might think that that would average the Josephson current to zero. But in this lovely paper, what these colleagues showed is that if you solve the necessary Langevin equation with just random KT fluctuations as a source of energy, the probabilities for the distribution of the phase difference over all possible confirmations, multiplied by the sign of the phase difference, which controls the Josephson current, integrated over time or angle, is not zero. So that means even though the phase isn't stable, the pairs are going through the junction. So you end up in the following situation. There's a pair current, but it's at finite voltage. And the solution of this model uh, gives the structural form of the pair current as a function of voltage. It's, you know, it, it's linear in voltage near zero voltage, but it's nonlinear elsewhere. And its maximum turns out, uh, sorry, and this is a demonstration from Bob Dines that um, STM tips can be used to do this. He didn't manage to make a microscope because in order to get the pair current at two Kelvin, they had to push the STM tip in until the junction resistance is 60 kilo ohms. But 60 kilo ohms is just a few quanta of conductance. You're basically touching the surface. If you try to move the tip, you just destroy the experiment. So they couldn't make a microscope, but they could show that this picture is correct. 
So what this picture says is that the pair current goes as a function of the voltage and the voltage is due to phase fluctuations according to a function that looks like this. And the maximum in the pair current, I am, is proportional to the Josephson critical current squared and some constants. Or if you took the derivative of this function, the d pair current, d pair voltage has a peak and the magnitude of that peak goes as the maximum in the pair current, which goes as the Josephson critical current squared. So either measuring this maximum or that peak, you can measure the Josephson critical current squared as a function of location, provided this model is correct. Uh, so now to make a microscope, what we want to do is to measure the condensed pair density as a function of location. We're going to do that by measuring the maximum of the pair current as a function of location and either measure this function or keep it constant, depending on the experiment. Or similarly, we could use the maximum in the differential uh, in the um, pair differential conductors. So to test this out now on a non exotic on a non threatening material, uh, we tried niobium diselenide, which is a very friendly, useful kind of um, gold standard material for testing STMs. It's a very nice superconductor, TC 7.2 Kelvin, the energy gaps above a millivolt. It's got a very nice charge density wave, uh, very robust. Um, and it's a very simple material that cleaves beautifully. Uh, but now what we want, but now we need to consider what is the impact of the coexistence of the superconductivity and the charge density. So suppose we have a simple S wave superconducting order parameter. Simultane coexisting with a charge density wave. There's a simple charge density wave, just one Q vector. Um, if they coexist, then in Ginsburg Landau, the total free energy density is allowed to have a term, which is this triple product. The charge modulation, uh, the, the complex conjugate of the pair field or, or the pair order parameter, and then another function, which is a modulation in the density of pairs uh, at minus Q. So this product has the same symmetries as the crystal. It's allowed to exist. You don't know how big lambda is. That depends on the particular material. But, you're, but what it implies is that if you have a charge density in the presence of a simple S wave superconductor, you necessarily will have a pair density modulation in the system. Okay. So here's a picture of the surface of niobium diselenide. So each dot there is a selenium atom. Um, and if you take the Fourier transform, you see the bright peaks of the crystal, and you see six more peaks. Those are the peaks associated with the density wave, which is a three unit cell charge density wave. Um, and this is, uh, these experiments are done well below one Kelvin, so the superconductivity is robust. Okay, so now the technical challenge for the poor experimentalists. So if you want to image the charge density wave, its characteristic energy scale is up here in the few tens of millivolts. So you have to do single electron tunneling with voltage, you know, voltage range in the tens of millivolts. Now, if you want to measure the Wagner lubans you have to go down here into the one millivolt range. And now this isn't the density of states because now we're using a superconducting tip. So it's a combination of the density of states in the sample plus the density of or convoluted with the density of states in the tip. So the gap we see here is about twice as big as it should be, but that makes perfect sense. Uh, but now this, these are still single positive particles. They're not pairs. If you want to image the pairs, you have to zoom down here another one or two orders of magnitude down into the tens of microvolt range. So you need a dynamic range for the STM in the range of 10 to the 5. So this, is, this machine is a great idea, but it was tricky to make it work because you need simultaneously to measure things at voltages which are different by a factor of about 10 to the 5. Anyway, actually, this isn't a simulation. This is data on this surface at 280 millikelvin. If you zoom way down here and look and see what exists there, you see the pair current. If you alter the distance of the tip from the surface, you see the pair current growing as the tip goes into the surface. You can compare, is that evolving correctly according to the junction resistance? Yes, it is, which you can measure independently. And is it evolving correctly with temperature? Yes, it is. We checked all those things in the development of the instrumentation. 
Okay, now let's do an experiment. So in this field of view, yeah, is that right? Yeah, so in, the, in that field of view, if we measure the density of states at minus 20 millivolts, we see the charge density wave quite clear. So simultaneously, we measure the normal state resistance. We do this at a voltage near about four millivolts. That's well outside the energy gap of the superconductor. If we take PIDV, that's one over the normal state resistance. So this is a simultaneous image of the normal state resistance. And now this image was taken with junction resistances in the giga ohm range, but this image was taken with junction resistances in the mega ohm range. So although they're in the same field of view, the setup for operation was very different. Then with this set of junction resistances, we measured the zero bias differential conductance. This has nothing to do with Majorana's, it's Cooper pairs traveling through the junction. The peak in the zero bias density of states is mapped as a function of location here. So these are all simultaneous. So now to image the pair density, we're going to multiply this guy by this guy squared. And when we do that, we get an image of the electron pair density in the superconductor. This is one of the first images, uh, probably the first image made of a transition metal dichalcogenide pair density. And now you see that we're dealing with very low junction resistances in the mega ohm range. So that involves a bunch of technology, which I don't have time to discuss. Okay, but now we have a simultaneous image of the charge modulations and the pair modulations. If you look at their Fourier transforms, you see the Bragg peaks and the CDW peaks. If you look at the Fourier transform, you see the Bragg peak of the pair wave function. It should be there, of course. The block states making the pairs are aware of the, of the edges, are aware of the crystal. And here you see the peaks of the pair density modulation, the pair density. Um, so these peaks are the crystal, all due to the crystal. These peaks are due to the density waves. So we can just filter the image and only keep the density waves. Now you see a simultaneous image of a charge density wave and its associated pair density wave in a conventional superconductor. Uh, we're pretty confident this is the first time this has been possible to do this. And I was very surprised when these images appeared because they're not identical. <laughs> if you learn to solve this problem in Ginsburg Landau theory, you might guess that they should be identical, but they're not, which is an interesting piece of new physics. Um, and I'll talk about that just a little bit more. Um, but in any case, now we can now have the technology to see pair modulations with subatomic resolution, with maybe 15 or 20 picometer scale distance resolution and to see how they're arranged in space, to see how they interact with impurity atoms, with vortex cores, et cetera, et cetera. Vortex. So we, we carried out the same experiment at the location of a vortex core. And so this is an image of the combined background density of states. Uh, yeah, I should have made clear, this modulation is not crossing zero. There's a background pair density, which is, you know, 99 point something percent. And then there's a modulation on top of it, which is in the range of a fraction of a percent. And you can see that here. So far away from the vortex core, you see the background pair density and you see the modulation on top of it. But as you pass through the vortex core, the homogeneous superfluid is getting destroyed by the vortex core and the amplitude of the pair density wave is diminishing. If we just remove the background, you can see that the amplitude of the pair density wave diminishes away into the middle of the core, and then it emerges on the other side, pretty much exactly the way you would expect from Ginsburg. -Land. So maybe not too surprising, but it is nice to see that, that the physics is as we anticipate for the interaction of a superconductor, a charge density wave, uh, and the pair density wave. The amplitude of the bottom, the amplitude curve on the bottom right is the same as the curve on the bottom yeah, the, left. The, 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 if I take, let's suppose I remove a parabola, which is fitting to this, then yeah. I end up with that. Yeah. It fits the answer. Yeah. Yeah. So the size of the vortex core is presumably the coherence. Say again? The size of the vortex core is the coherence. Yeah, it, it's. So is that telling you that the wavelength of the pair density wave is significantly smaller than the coherence? Yes. Yes, it is because that's correct. Because in this case, it's mm -hmm. not spontaneous. 
it's being produced by this product term, right? If you want to make this term have the same symmetry as the crystal, then the pair modulation has to have the same magnitude as wave vector as the charge modulation. So that's, the, so that's the, basically the gradient. Yeah, that's right. It, and the charge, yes, that's right. The charge modulation is set by a higher, higher energy phenomenon, right. and the pair density modulation is following. Or if you wrote it in Ginzburg Antov equations, oftentimes the coherence length for the pair density order parameter is not written to be the same as the pair density, the coherence length for the superconductor. They don't have to be. Okay. All right. So, anyway, Ginzburg lambda seems to work very nicely. Um, so, the other thing is, you know, if I just put these two images on top of each other, you'd see that they are not the same. In fact, they're always shifted by a certain phase difference, which is two thirds uh, pi over a naught um, or two pi minus two thirds, which is four thirds minus pi over a naught. Um, in niobium diselenide, the pair density wave maxima are shifted from the charge density, oops, are shifted from the charge density wave maxima. So here's the charge density wave maxima. Here's the pair, and this is data. Here's the pair density wave maxima. Here's the crystal measured simultaneously. They are always shifted from each other. We showed that that's a universal property. It, at present, not well understood. We all kind of guess there must be a Ginsburg Landau term which causes this to happen, but there isn't a simple one. Because well, <laughs> lambda could be complex. Pardon? Your Ginsburg Landau property is lambda. Could be. Could be a complex number. Or could be, yes. The phase yeah. of that. But the there'd have to be a microscopic reason for it. Yes. But I agree. A universal, you mean universal for this material or universal? So we, we checked. So there are actually three pair density waves here. There's one on, going in three different directions. And for each of them, you can image the phase. So you can image three different phase fields for the charge density modulations, three different phase fields for the pair density modulations. You can subtract each phase field from its sibling, and you find universally the difference is 2 pi over 3 a naught. Okay, it's all within the same material. Oh, yes, just oh, in okay. this material. Okay. It, at present, it appears to be a mystery of this material, but okay, sure. no one's ever done this experiment before, so we yeah. don't know yeah. what's the universality of this phenomenon. Okay. okay. All right, so that was my final point. There is a bazillion transition metal monocalcogenides, dicalcogenides, and tricalcogenides that are superconductors with charge density rates. So we can already see that lots of people now have turned their attention to studying this phenomenon. All right, so CuO2. So this experiment was done primarily by Mohammed Hamidian and Steve Edkins, with this team of colleagues. So starting about five years ago, there's a great deal of interest in whether there is a strong coupling pair density wave um, occurring in the undergoed cupolas. This phenomenon would be, it's not due to some you know, splitting of the Fermi surface by applied magnetic field or something like that. It's due to the solution of the 2D Hubbard model finding a ground state which has a modulation in the charge density, a modulation in the spin density, and a modulation in the pair density as the solution. Now that's a controversial statement among theorists, but it's a perfectly logical question. Does such a phenomenon exist in the undergrowth cubits? At least it's logical to an experimental. <laughs> okay, so to answer that, we tried to make a stand doses in STM, which could de deal with D wave superconductivity. So, to do that, we learned how to exfoliate a tiny little nanoscale piece of ITC superconductor, BISCO, onto our scan chip, which is made of um, tungsten. Now, now we, so why are we doing this? We, we want to make the Josephson energy as high as possible, and we want to make the temperature as low as possible so we can stabilize the Josephson current and get the maximum pair current. So to make the Josephson energy high, we would like to drive up the energy gap as much as possible in both the tip and the sample. We'd like to drive down the junction resistance, and we'd like to drive down the temperature. So we did all of those things. We made a dilution fridge STM, it's a Calvinox MX400. Um, we drove up the energy gap by making the tip a high TC superconductor, and we drove Mohammed drove down the junction resistance with new technology for operating STMs. And we then were able to show 
it is a high T super, superconducting tick because if you measure the single particle um, uh, differential conductance, you see that the energy difference between the two maxima is four delta, not two delta. So two delta are coming from the sample and two delta are coming from the tick. And we can still retain atomic resolution and we can repeat this process multiple times. It's not easy, but we have repeated this process multiple times with different ticks, and so have our colleagues in group table. Okay. So with this, with this style of tip, if you push that tip slowly in decreasing the normal state junction resistance at millikelvin temperatures, you push that guy in, you see the Josephson branch appearing, and now you have a decent current for some fraction of a nanoamp, even though the voltage applied is 10 microvolts. There are no quasi-particles can do this. This is only pairs going through the junction, or predominantly pairs going through the junction. So now what we want to measure is the maximum in this current, pair current, as a function of location, because we believe that the pair field in the sample is that maximum times the junction resistance. So in this field of view, no, no, no. if we measure the maximum in the pair current, yes, sir. The previous slide, yeah, yeah. it's curved at offset. Yeah, yeah, they are. yeah. The zeros are all offset. So the zero of current. Oh, oh, between here and here. No, no, between yeah. the different. Yeah, they're offset. They're offset from each other. So, so a more interesting thing, Subir, is that the um, simple RSJ style dynamical equation for the junction fails when you make the junction resistance too low. The dynamics becomes unstable and starts oscillating between different states. So to do the experiment, we just stay away from that. So in this field of view, if we measure the maximum in the doses in current, we see the pair condensate of the cube rates. I think this probably was the first image ever made of the pair condensate of the cube rates. And it has a whole bunch of interesting things. These holes in the order parameter are, are there deliberately. We put zinc atoms in the crystal so we could calibrate whether the machine is working or not because zinc destroys the condensate. But if you look elsewhere, you can see there is a modulation. Or at least the STM person could see that there's a modulation. <laughs> there's a very nice modulation, which is in the one zero and zero one direction in the density of pairs. If we take the Fourier transform, we see it quite clearly. So this is the half zero point. This is the quarter zero point. So it's a four unit cell modulation in the Josephson critical current square. That's the fact. Um, okay. So keep that in your mind. That. This certainly triggered a lot of interest in searching for pair density waves and the rates, but it's also somewhat controversial because people believe the wavelength we reported is somehow incorrect. We'll come back to that. All right, so next thing that happened was, it was suggested that if this state exists, one should find it in the vortex area. And so pretty much the same team of colleagues worked on this project. This was Steve Atkins' PhD thesis. So we've known for decades that in the cube rates, some charge density modulation appears at high temperatures. Then when you enter the superconducting state, it kind of diminishes again. Okay? This is Steve Hayden's beautiful work. And then if you turn on a magnetic field, the charge modulations get stronger and stronger and stronger. So the point is you can control the charge modulations by applying a magnetic field. But Certainly the charge is modulating, but is it modulating because the order parameter is a CDW order parameter or a PDW order parameter? I think that question has not been fully answered. So here's a beautiful paper by Daniel Ekteberg um, in which he proposed an experiment which could tell whether the object produced in the vortex core by applying the magnetic field is a PDW or a CDW. And essentially what he arg argued is this. Imagine you have a high TC superconductor with a very tiny coherence phase. So this is a, the region of a vortex. This is the symmetry point of the vortex. The order parameter is destroyed in this little region here. And over this region, it, it's, no, it's non-zero and it's recovering to its maximum value. Assume that a PDW is nucleated in that region. Then you can analyze that model in Gaines Rag Lambda. You have and so he didn't say, assume you have a charge density. If he just said, assume you have a superconductor and a pair density wave appears, 
Then you have two order parameters. One is the homogeneous order parameter of the superconductor, and the other is the order parameter of the pair density. If you consider the various Ginsberg-Landau products, which are allowable, one of them is a product between the pair density wave and the homogeneous superconductor. That will give a modulation of density of states or charge at the wave vector of the pair density. Another product is a product of the pair density wave with its conjugate. That will give a modulation of density of states or charge with twice that wave vector. So in this model, the smoking gun was to be a Fourier transform of the image of the induced charge modulations, which would have two peaks and their Q vectors are related by a factor of two. And furthermore, one of these, one of these density modulations is occurring because of a product between a function which is decaying exponentially with itself. So this one decays twice as fast in space as this one. That means in Q space, the line width of the two Q modulation should be twice the line width of the one Q modulation. So there's a summary of the list of the predictions. So we tried to, Steve Enkins did this experiment. So um, here's an image of this goal. This is near one Kelvin. The magnetic field is zero. We're registered to about 16,000 atoms there. Um, oh, and we have to do this elaborate thing because the experts here know that the electronic structure of the cuprates is horribly disordered. So I have to subtract the background electronic structure from the field induced electronic structure to find out what did the magnetic field do. So in this field of view, we measure the electronic structure with high precision. And then about a month later, in this field of view, we measured it at 8.5 Tesla. So they actually are different. During that month, this atom here had moved. Oops. See it? <laughs> that one had moved. So they are different experiments. Um, this allows us to image the density of states at high field, image the density of states at low field, subtract one from the other with subatomic precision and get the difference. So the data is in the bottom right hand image here. It's the difference, it's the field induced effects on the density of states. So we found two phenomena. One is that at low voltage near the chemical potential, we found the classic density of states modulations that Jenny Hoffman discovered for her thesis um, too long ago to specify. Um, uh, but what Edkins discovered is if you look at the gap edge, you see a very different, this is the same vortex, but here you see a much more tricky looking object. If you take the Fourier transform of these images, you find that they have two peaks going in the one zero direction, two peaks going in the zero one and the ratio of the two vectors within our error bars is two. And in fact, we can repeat this experiment four times and for dozens of vortices, there's many vortices in the field of view. So when we do all that, we find that the line width of the two Q peak is twice the line width of the one Q peak um, shown here. Um, these modulations are definitely coming from the vortex plot. They satisfy the constraint of induced pair density wave and Edkins even showed that the gap, the induced gap modulations have eight unit cell periods. So that was cool. There's some nice theory papers analyzing these results and concluding they do provide strong evidence that there is a field induced pair density. Number three. So the traditional way to search for a pair density rate would be to search for a modulation of the field of the pair field, the energy gap. Okay. Has a question. Okay. Yes, I, I want to ask a question about vortices actually. In, one can show that every vortex and superconductors should have also some extra electron density, uh, extra charge effect, yeah. or yeah. Is a charge. I just wonder whether uh, you can detect it and whether it's uh, relevant for your story or not. Well, there certainly is additional density of states in the cores. You can see it on the left hand side of zero of the top panel here. And these are field states, so there is some charge in there. Uh, but detecting it directly, we have not been able to do. It wasn't our objective, but I think there's good evidence that there is charge in there. Okay, very good, thank you. Energy gap. So this work uh, is led by our colleagues in Brookhaven, Peter Johnson and 
Fujita san. Um, you know, for decades, people have been able to measure the single particle spectrum in a field of view in BISCO. If you take the distance between here and here and call it two delta, divide by two, make a map of delta, it looks like this. This map has no modulations. For two decades, people have studied these maps and they have no modulations. That's a well-known fact. I mean, it's a well-known negative fact, but there is no modulations. If you use a tungsten tip, you don't detect a pair density modulation. And I had basically given up on that. But the genius of Fujita-san is that he did not give up. He said, instead of taking a tungsten tip, let's try a BISCO tip using our BISCO tip technology. So he, here was the gap of his original non-superconducting tip. Here's the gap after he made the BISCO tip. Here's the topographic image with the high TC tip. Um, now he, therefore, assuming the gap in the tip is constant, and we'll come back to that, he can measure the distance between these two energies and make an image of the gap in the sample. Actually, it's modulated. You can see that by taking a line cut. So this is the maximum in the tunneling conductance. It's the coherence peak. And this is the energy between the two coherence peaks. And it's modulating in space with a disordered but eight units of periods. Or you can take the Fourier transform. It has two sharp peaks close to eight units of periods. So this was a remarkable observation. It was, came as a surprise to me, but it's a fascinating and beautiful observation that the gap actually is modulating if you use a BISCO tip to measure it, which is strange. Uh, furthermore, he was able to show that the two charge modulations at 2Q and 1Q are also detected in this experiment. Now, in order to rationalize the fact that the gap appears to be modulating with eight unit cells and the Josephson pair current modulating with four unit cells, Fujita-san made this interesting co conjecture Basically, that there are two independent tunneling channels. One is from the Q equals zero homogeneous pairs in the tip to the Q equals zero homogeneous pairs in the sample. And the other one is from the finite Q pairs in the tip to the finite Q pairs in the sample. If you're willing to stipulate to that hypothesis, then you'll find an eight unit cell modulation in the gap, and you'll find a four unit cell modulation in the pair. Because now the pair current uh, for the PDW is independent of the pair current for the super. So this is a conjecture, it's not a fact, but it's on the table for discussion. One way to test this would be to use an Iobium tip, which is what we're working on now. Because if the modulation is coming from the BISCO tip, if we do an Iobium tip, it should disappear. What is the ratio of the pair density modulation to the fact? Q equals yeah. zero and the Q equals. Q equals so the minus. assumption is the PDW is in the tip as well. Yeah, what is the magnitude? What percentage of the dense pair density is being modulated? Oh, it's about 10% at this moment. It's a big effect. Yeah. Very robust. We wouldn't have found it anyway. All right. Number four, quasi particles. So this project is led by Peter Hirschfeld and P.S. Chubet, and then experimental team and material science team. Well, this is again another picture of the top surface of BISCO. You can see each bismuth atom there. They, they look nice. They have been rendered periodic by some tricky mathematics. <laughs> but uh, we can see every atom with high precision. Now. Wait, but let me go back. Yeah. So you're saying in the superconducting state, there's a period of modulation in the charge density. That's basically what you're saying, right? So, so I'm going to address the issue, and there's going to be another talk next week to address the issue of what happens when we don't see any CDW. But in most of our experiments, we have no CDW, but we have a strong PDW. Well, but, but when the PDW coexists with the background D wave, yes. then there should be a period A to C, at least in principle, there should be one. It should period be A principle. charge one. Yes. 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 Yeah, well, that's what Fujita reported. Right, so Here. the why so in principle x ray scattering should also see that. Oh, well, I don't do x rays, so oh. that's a question for x ray. Okay, right, but and uh, but the it's I guess it's important to say, Subir, that this isn't a measure of charge, it's a measure of density of states. We don't know how much charge is in each state. Oh, uh, okay, right, okay, but all right. 
first uh, the two bit. Okay, now imagine what does the electronic structure look like in this very nice, friendly, homogeneous periodic field of view? Well, it looks like this. It looks absolutely incredibly strange, right? It's much more complicated than the crystal. That's because much of the contrast is at atoms that you don't see on the top surface at the oxygen atoms. Um, it's bond centered and so in many ways it's a glass, some kind of bond centered electronic glass. Um, and this is true for a wide range of doping in this case. Nevertheless, if you were to zoom in here very carefully, let's see if I can do this for you. In this region here, there's some nice periodic little pieces. If, if I paid you 10 pounds to look for little regions which are periodic in this image, then you would earn hundreds of pounds. There are lots of them. They just don't have any long range or. And if you zoom in, you can see them, right? If we zoom into a small field of view, 100 angstroms, you see them very nicely. They're bond centered. That means they're, this is a line of oxygen atoms. This is a line of oxygen atoms. This is a line of oxygen atoms. They're unidirectional. This is four unit cells. This is eight unit cells. So this is oxychloride. This is BISCO, same thing. Four unit cells, eight unit cells, bond center, same back. So there's some fundamental phenomenon which gets repeated in different cuprates at the same carrier density as shown here. <coughs> All right. Um, now there's a nice paper I don't have time to review here by Una Kim, where she used machine learning to search for these objects in this picture, in these pictures as a function of doping and showed that at all dopings up to above 17%, these objects are the predominant object. And they're not, the reason why they're not detected by, let's say X-ray or very robustly by X-ray or other techniques is that they don't have long range order. They have lots of face slips, just tiny little domains with lots of face slips. All right. So now we want to zoom in on one of these objects, one of these guys, and try to understand what is it, what is causing this um, tunneling conductance to modulate in this fashion. Uh, okay, so um, Herschel and Chuba, so this is a real field of view. This is the real modulation measures in that field of view. That's four unit cells, that's eight unit cells. We're talking about this token. So they use the um, TJ model, but then um, simplified it by using um, renormalization, Goetz Miller renormalization factors independent for charge and spin and allowed them to vary by size. And then, given that degree of freedom, decoupled the Hamiltonian into three mean fields. One is the charge on the copper site, one is the bond field between copper sites, and the third one is the electron pair field, which is also between adjacent sites. And then solve that model to find what states exist. So at parameters equivalent to underdoped cuprates, they find that there is both a pair density modulation and a charge density modulation coexisting together. And the pair density modulation is what's producing the charge density modulation. We now know that from Chuchu's work. When you go above TC, yeah. The peak at one quarter is much bigger than the peak. At. That's what they report. But that, that does not, this is not just said that, that, that the one at one eight is produced the one at one quarter. So, so, so the, um, let's see, this is charge, okay? And the, the charge modulation at one eighth in this model is much weaker than the charge modulation yeah. at one quarter. Exactly, but that's, that, that, is, that is the status here. But, you just said that the one at one quarter is produced by the one at one eight. Yeah. So then it should be smaller. Well, okay. Um, let's say they coexist in this case. Fair enough. Fair enough. They, they, and I should have made clear, thank you, Sudhir, I should have made clear that their solution is a coexisting pair density wave order parameter plus homogeneous D wave superconductor. Both of those two order parameters have D form factor. Okay. okay that's great. Right. And the charge density wave, because it's really yeah. independent. Fine. Symmetry wise, it's not, but because it's so much bigger, you are. Fair enough. We, we, we can let, let, let's. Let. So, so the object I call quasi particles in this presentation is the object you're calling charge density. That's the bottom uh, line. 
that I, I defer to your yeah your I mean that that's what these peaks represent. They represent density of electronic states yeah. in their calculation um, of the eigenstates of those problems. Okay. Yeah. So here's the prediction for as a function of energy and units of the pair density rate gap. Um, for an eight unit cell PDW, what should the density of electronic states look like in real space? These are the Bogdaloo bonds of a pair density. Okay, so when we compare that with the experiment, there is a good correspondence between what's observed inside these little domains and the prediction from the TJ model. Quantitatively, we could show that the correspondence between the experimental observation and their model reaches um, a cost correlation coefficient of near 0.8. That actually means in detail, in, in geometrical detail and relative intensity, the experiment is very close to the theoretical model. This experiment is measuring the quasiparticles from, by tunneling of electrons from the tip. And this theory is predicting the quasiparticles of the pair density. If I take the Fourier transform of quasiparticle experimental data, yeah. do, you, do you see a peak at one eight? Um, so if we use okay. a tungsten tip, no. Okay. If, if Fujita uses a Visco tip, yes. Okay. That's that's where we are. I have a summary at the end of the talk, which I'm happy to give. So also they could predict the gap modulation. And we could measure it roughly, it's tricky to do, but the gap also in this experiment inside these domains appears to have a primarily eight unit cell model. Okay. How much time do I have left? Up an hour. Okay. All right. So uh, I think Chu Chu already um, described her project uh, on the. Uh, pursuit of the same model into the pseudo gap regime, but I'm going to describe it again for three minutes just to integrate it with the rest of the presentation. So this work was led by Xu Chu Wang at Oxford uh, with a colleague with Zhou Chen, and the theory was done by Pinch and Peter. So in these compounds, we can measure density of electronic states as a function of energy. Now we're at low doping, low 10%. We take the ratio of the field states to the empty states because there's a serious systematic problem we need to do this to avoid. And then we take the Fourier transform of this image to find the Q vectors of the scattering interference patterns. So here's a picture of the density of the movie of the density of electronic states. Here's a movie of this ratio. It brings out more clearly the various modulations. And here's a movie of its Fourier transform. Well, there's a lot of action there as a function of energy. So what Fujita showed us how to do is to integrate over energy and just combine all possible scattering processes into one image. This image is called lambda in our business. And it's a way of showing all different scattering processes over all the energies in where scattering interference is observed. It's an efficient way to fingerprint um, scattering interference. And if you have a model for identifying an ordered state, which would produce that interference pattern. So now Chupe um, pursued his model, solving for um, at, at low doping, increasing the temperature and solving for the charge, bond, and pair field modulations as a function of increasing temperature. And what he found is that um, the homogeneous superconductivity diminishes. It actually doesn't disappear. There's a region where it's kind of tenuous and eventually it disappears. And the PDW order parameter uh, diminishes, but it's quite strong in the model at the point where the TC of the superconductor, where you reach the TC of the superconductor. So what this model describes is a PDW above TC of the D-wave superconductor. PDW is superconductor. Pardon? PDW. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it, it discovers a finite Q superconductor above the TC of the Q equal to zero superconductor. Okay. That's correct. 
So um, from the same model, they can, so they had to find the Bogolubov eigenstates, then put an impurity atom in the calculation, then calculate the scattering interference that would tell them this function. Um, oh, sorry, that would tell them this function from the Green's functions of the PDW plus DSC and do that as a function of temperature. This is TC of the homogeneous order parameter. Above that TC, the pair density wave exists in the model. Um, then Chu Chu studied the temperature dependence of the same phenomenon from here to about here, 1.5 times above TC. You see the spectrum going from here, but as we go up in temperature, diminishing away rapidly. So um, anyone who would like to see these data, I think she'd be happy to show them to you, but here are the Fourier transforms of the integrated scattering interference. And here's the model. Here's the scattering interference detected above TC of the Q equal to zero supernova. Um, and uh, Peyush was able to impose a four unit cell CDW in the same model. It doesn't exist in the ground state, but he could impose it. So we can compare the predictions for an eight unit cell scattering interference in the pseudo gap phase with the predictions of a four unit cell CDW in the pseudo gap phase with the experiment. And on that basis, we think that these signatures provide good evidence that there is a PW in the pseudo gap phase of this compound. Modulo the fact that Subir is alluding to that up here, there is no zero resistance transport. So it would have to be somehow a phase disordered super uh, PDW about this. That's where we are. I'd love to discuss this more, but maybe it's probably. Okay. <laughs> Last but not least, so this was appeared on the archive, I believe, this morning. So this project is led by Wei Chen at Oxford. Back to Josephson company. So take one of these Visco tips. Here is the pair spectrum. Here's the maximum in the pair current. Here's an image of that maximum as a function of location. Um, you know, it goes up to a decent current actually at low junction resistance, tens of picoamps. And at this doping, there are no detectable charge modulations, neither looking in real space nor looking in the Fourier transform of the IDD from the negative gap edge to the positive to the gap edge, we don't see any charge modulations. It's 17% plus or minus 1% there. But we do see the pair modulations quite clearly. This other modulation here is the crystal supermodulation, which I'm ignoring today. I talked about it on Monday. Here is the four unit cell pair modulation. Okay. So we can take this data and just extract the spectral weight from these two peaks, the modulation in the y direction, and these two peaks, the modulation in the x direction. So that's an image of the modulations, which are measured in this field of view in terms of this current for constant junction resistance. You can see that they're disordered, but they're not as disordered as you think. Um, this is 20 nanometers, 200 angstroms. So this is a large field of view. The coherence length, which we already knew from the narrowness of these peaks, the coherence length of the pair modulation is much better than the coherence length of the so-called charge modulation in this compound. You can see there are regions where the pair modulations are really quite coherent and robust. Okay. Now with um, locking techniques, we can define the amplitude of the Josephson critical current squared, which is what this is. That's what this is. It's the maximum in the pair current, which is the Josephson critical current squared. We can define the amplitude of that function throughout space and just um, neglect the detailed modulations at the Q vector. So we just consider the amplitude of these two order parameters. It looks like this. You can see that calculation worked fine. <laughs> And now you can define a pneumatic order parameter. You could subtract uh, the amplitude in one direction minus the amplitude in the other direction and divide by the sum. So that would define a pneumatic order parameter for these modulations. Here it is, AX minus NY. So this one 
And, and this is logical. It is the amplitude square that we're subtracting. So AX minus AY over AX plus AY, it looks like this. It's got well-defined domains. The statistics are such as that there are significant regions where the order parameter is near one, predominant modulations in one direction, or minus one, predominant modulations in the other direction. And, you know, this isn't just a fantasy. I mean, look at this region here. That's actually the data in this region, predominant modulations. And similarly uh, here, predominant modulations in the other direction. Or we can just go in and check. You can go into one of these domains and check. Uh, if I go to one region, if I measure the modulations in one direction, they're large. In the other direction, they're in the noise, and vice versa. So what this tells us is that um, this is a predominantly unidirectional modulation in the Josephson critical curve square. That would be most consistent with a unidirectional pair density wave, which is otherwise disordered probably by local atoms or impurity atoms or something like that. That's what would be breaking it up into this strange state where you have the two IC domains with fairly long coherence lengths, but not infinite. And this, again, this is near 17%. So we're nowhere near the high order region of the phase time. All right, so let me wind this up. So to visualize the pair density, we used a high TC superconducting tip and measured the maximum in the pair current. So to visualize the internal structure of the vortex halo, we use a normal tungsten tip and measure the single particle density of state. So this is two meter tunneling, this is one. To measure the energy gap, Ujita-san used a high TC superconducting tip, but at high voltage. So he was still only tunneling single electrons. He's measuring at more than 100 millivolts, which is where the gap energy is. So as far as we understand it, there was no pair tunneling. The quasi-particle experiments use tungsten tips. So they're just the density of single particle states. The pseudo gap experiment used tungsten tips, single particle states. And the last project I showed you used a superconducting tip in the Josephson regime. So it's imaging the Josephson pair tunnel squared. Okay. <clears throat> we are confident that there is a robust modulation in the density of pairs, condensed pairs, in this part of the phase diagram of this. Now, whether that modulation is a true pair density wave in the platonic sense of the pure form of a pair density wave with no other complications. We don't know. The data coexists with the superconductor. That remains to be determined. But you know, if you're of a more Aristotelian bent, then this is strong evidence that pair density waves do exist in the um, So, okay, so Subir, so when we measure the current, we get a four unit cell modulation. Um, when we measure the energy gap in the vortex, we get an eight unit cell modulation. When we measure the end, when Fujita-san measures the energy gap homogeneously, he gets an eight unit cell variation. When we predict the density of states for comparison with the experiment, um, we use an eight unit cell order parameter. And when we predict the QPI signature, we use an eight unit cell order parameter. And finally, in the pneumatic experiment, we again recover four unit cell periods. So two E pairing is producing this four unit cell modulation. And one E pairing is coming in, is producing the eight unit cell modulation. And this eight unit cell modulation is being produced whether or not the tip is superconducting. So it's difficult to understand how this situation can be, except maybe if Fujita's hypothesis is correct. So last but not least, you know, can the pseudo gap be a pair density wave? It can't be a superconducting pair density wave. I agree, it's not superconducting. But can it be a phase fluctuating pair density wave? Well, here's Patrick Lee's original proposal that the spectral function is not consistent with that of a CDW, but is consistent with that of a pair density wave. 
Um, everyone knows that there's a gap in the antinodal regions and no gap near the node in the pseudo gap regime. But of course, the gap structure for a bare density node is exactly like that. That's precisely what it's supposed to be like. It should be particle hole symmetric, but the photo emission colleagues can't protect whether that's true. Or not. Although Peter, Peter Johnson would say it is. Uh, we think the modulations we can see, which we know by comparison of Q vectors with X ray scattering studies, are the same modulations which are being reported by X ray studies. We think these are the bond to bonds of the pyramid. And finally, Chu Chu's project shows that there is a QPI signature in the pseudo gap phase, and at present it appears to be consistent with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks for discussion and questions. Also, what I call where did you see the schematic? So, where do we detect the signal? The, the, the matter. Ah, here, right here. Right. So, our guess is that by the time we would get down here, we would grow and become homogeneous. That's the working. We're trying to do that. It's right there. Um, Especially with more lines within the pseudo gap phase, you know, T stars and T C's, yeah. multiple, you know, the, the silence from uh, D Bertrand, for example, of some region where there's a red reflection uh, uh, and a red resistance. And it could be consistent with this D density node, really, but again, it does be maybe there's a group of lines where it's not all the same. Do you see any variation within it? So, you know, for the argument I show you on the screen here to make sense. The definition of the pseudo gap would have to be the region where there is a gap in the single particle disk yeah. states. Yeah. So within that definition, this is a plausible hypothesis. Okay. Um, you know, the charge modulations fill up a fraction of this gap. By the way, you know, there's no TC for the so-called CDW. No one has ever detected yeah. a TC for the yeah. CDW transition. All that happens is that the intensity comes out smooth. Well, that happens somewhere in the um, Well, in some of the other classic yeah. observations, for example, the suppression of the susceptibility, the change in the night shift, they would all be consistent because what it does is suppress the density of states where the result is. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make a distinction between very low temperature studies yeah. and pseudo gap. Okay. So, very low temperature, you made a, a very convincing case uh, that there is a, well, pair density with a period period one eight. Yeah. Uh, and by your own equation for nitrogen, that's selenite. That means there's also a charge density wave at period one eight. Okay. Now we can argue what's driving this. But the bottom line is, in the superconducting state, you will now have evidence for a period eight charge density modulation. It could be driven by pair density wave, but there is a charge density wave modulation at period one eight, which so, you had not seen in so, earlier. So, so everything you say is correct, but we don't measure charge. So what we have is evidence that the density of states modulates at that point. Okay, yeah. at period one eight. Yeah. Yes. Correct. And, um, okay, so that's that's very nice. But now let's go to you know the finite temperature right. where it's saying it's a fluctuating pair density wave. What that is, we don't have a theory for. Uh, I have discussed Patrick's proposal now in my talk on Wednesday. Uh, and we have an alternative way of explaining just that data. Uh, although their proposal doesn't work in the model points. Uh, if you look at the spectrum away from you mean it, it doesn't match the empirical facts in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas ours does, but anyway, that's the thing. So what and finally for the QPI data at the bottom right. Yeah. Uh, I think so where when you show uh Chuve's CDW model, presumably he's imposing a CDW on the large body surface. Yes. 
which we know doesn't exist in fourth dimension. Well, in this model, it does. <laughs> no. Right, and it gets snapped by the PDW. So they no, have, but, no, I, okay. No, no, they have an internally severe. They have an internally consistent proposal. Uh, they I take mean, a large Fermi surface. Um, they take a large Fermi surface. Yes. And then, um, well, they have to see the PDW in order to find it, of course. But then when the PDW is there, it automatically gaps the antinode. So then only the arcs of the Fermi surface of the PDW exist. Uh, okay, you haven't shown any single electron spectral data in the PDW. Uh, and I'd be, I'd be very surprised to see that you're okay. anything like photovision. That's but a, Nick, that, that wasn't my point. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'm not, that model is fine, but you also showed a competing model which you said didn't work. And that was, you know, and I'm questioning the competing model. We just take a CDW. Okay. And that was the model. Carrot, no, go back. Yeah. The right. This the right back. Yeah. I think one can do a better competing model. Uh, you start from, and we'll work on that. I'd okay. Love to try to propose another model, and we'd love to see if it does better. Okay, so so let, let me ask you, thank you for the excellent question. So let me ask you, please. So what would be the observable that we should search for in this part of the phase diagram, which would rule out the PDW as a hypothesis? Just get rid of it, get it off the table. But it's, look, as you just said, it's, it's a fluctuating PDW, which yeah. none of these theories are. So I, mean, I don't even know what to make of the theory that we play. They're not valid theories because the theory is superconductive, and this is a not anywhere close to a superconductive theory. Uh, Imagine in the best of all possible worlds that we could measure uh, no, the order, whole... order parameter magnitude, which was modulated, and we could measure phase fluctuations yeah. and show that they had overwhelmed the super. No, no, you have beautiful data. I thought we, we should try. We now, the whole purpose of everything I talked about was how do you have a theory of a fluctuating whatever? How do you have a theory of a fluctuating spin density wave, phase density wave? It's up to theory to provide that. And that theory has not provided okay. that, okay? I agree. So I don't know what to make of the theory. There is no theory. We do have a theory and we'll try to do that. <laughs> so at finite temperature. So, so <laughs> can, can you predict this function for us? We will work on it. I'm, that would be wonderful. <laughs> it would be No, it's been very, very interesting to see this. Yeah. You know, so what the theory we want to use, we want to start from our FL star, put a CDW on it, yeah. and see what we get. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. We'll work on it. That would be wonderful. So, the way they did it was they found the eigenstates of their model yeah. as a function of energy. Right. And they just put a delta function scatter, basically okay. a Born approximation. Okay. And from that, they found the density of states as a function of energy. Fourier transform summed and produced this function. That's okay. how they, I mean, I'm happy even, to talk even, with Peter. Even we could do that if we had the degrees function. I'm happy to <laughs> talk with Peter and uh, see if okay. they're interested. So okay. we'll, we'll... <laughs> Yours. Yeah, so I can remember talking about pseudo gaps uh, in the 90s with people. Oh, um, no. uh, and, and one of the things that the basic properties they seem to have in, in the high DC is that whatever form of order you have there, it's got a finite correlation and probably a finite correlation time, but it persists over a very broad region of the base diagram. And so one can ask the question, what kinds of features in a, in a long wave of action? Well, of course, it's a classical theory, ultimately, right? It's fine temperature. Give you give you persistent regions of, of finite. I don't know how long the correlation ends up. We, we know that, for example, the Heisenberg magnet in two dimensions has a huge region of long correlation lengths, and that you can do a pretty good job of describing it using mean field theory on short distances. So presumably, the fact that these mean field theories seem to do a halfway decent job on on, on describing the data, but there's no supercurrent means that means that you've got such a theory, but a theory that loves to create long correlation lengths, but without locking in as true long range orders. It's quite unlike an Ising order of gravity, for example, which once it starts to just goes zoom yeah. into long range order. So does that mean that we've got a higher manifold of order parameters to 
or, or what is the origin of this of this persistent fluctuation? It's, it's got it's got to be a property of the of the un, underlying pseudo effect. One would imagine invest loves to persist. I mean, even if you believe that that getting rid of disorder will improve matters, perhaps give it long range order. I don't know. Um, still, it's got a strong susceptibility to. Uh, having this kind of behavior. I think it's very, it's very mysterious. Um, we don't, I mean, the only way we know of doing it is by giving higher order parameter manifolds. But yes. why, why should this system have an SO5-ish or yeah. large order parameter manifold? What, what, especially if it's just a U1 degree of freedom. Or maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe there are many directions that can fluctuate at once. It's living on a higher manifold. I don't know. Yeah, so I'm really not competent to discuss which one of those. I mean, I've read the papers about all the different manifolds that it's could the, involve it's, multiple. It, it's manifolds. out of desperation in the sense <laughs> that, that you don't know of any other way to produce long so, so I, correlation. I, I'll tell you the other thing which strikes the experimentalists, which is that the reality of the electronic structure or the band structure is more complicated than often considered. There's just other degrees of freedom inside the unit cell and at different energies with different properties. Mm -hmm. So to us, it you know, in fact, it feels more familiar to the iron-based superconductors to us than it is to the pure single band copper superconductors, because there's a lot of other degrees of freedom available in the system which are often not considered. Well, that's always the impression. Alert from system UI server. Low battery. Oops, oh. <laughs> Alert from com.apple.battery-monitor. <laughs>